I love prophecy because prophecy prepares me for what God is preparing. And we need to be in agreement with Him. I need to be prepared for what He's doing so that I can be recipients of all these good things that He has for me in His kingdom. And therefore, as we talked about at the end of last week's or last session, we need to understand what God's going to do in the last days. So take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 24. Now, I love this chapter. It's kind of an overview of what's going to happen in the last days. I've taught it many times, but I always run into the frequent problem, and that is we kind of run out of time for the last session. And so I want to really focus in, not beginning with chapter 24 and verse 1, but beginning with verse 32. Because there we're going to learn something that that we need to know in order to understand just the heart of God and what He's about. So look with me to Matthew 24, verse 32. But before we get there, we need to understand who He's speaking to why he's speaking to them, what he has addressed, and how he concludes this session. So Matthew 24, Messiah begins, and he's coming out of the temple, right? And his disciples come to him, and they emphasize the material. They say, do you see these buildings? And they're the temple buildings, but understand there's also the Sanhedrin on the Temple Mount. This is the governmental buildings, and it's put there according to Judaism, the ancient sages, that worship of God should impact our rule, our government, our community. So it was strategic that these governmental offices were also on the Temple Mount. And they speak about the beauty of these. And Messiah says, I tell you, Not one stone will be left upon another that will not be cast down. And then he kind of slips away. And the next thing you see is that he is on the Mount of Olives, a very uh, uh, end times location. And there once more the disciples find him and they want to know more. They ask, you know, when will these things be? And they go on to say, what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now pay attention to that last statement, the end. You cannot understand this 24th chapter unless you pay close attention to this word end and know what end he's referring to. So they come to him and they ask, and here's an important truth. He speaks about, initially, the events of 70 A.D. And more and more, people think that this whole chapter, whole chapter, is about 70 A.D. rather than the last days. Now, what's he doing? Well, he's saying, if I can accurately tell you 40 years ahead of time what's going to happen to Jerusalem and the Temple Mount, was he right? Yes, he was. So if he was right about that, foretelling what is going to happen, he also can be right, and he will be, about what's going to happen in the last days. So the destruction of the temple, the the destruction of the holy city of Jerusalem and the nation of Judah in 70 A.D. simply confirms his words and should cause us to take seriously with authority, his words about the kingdom of God. That's the purpose. But more and more people are looking at this scripture that we're going to be looking at, the book of Revelation and prophecy in general, and saying, you know what? God really never taught anything about the last days. Because all these things that you think are about the last days, this judgment, this destruction, this peril, these birth pains, all of that, I got good news for you. They've all come and gone. In fact, what we can expect is just little by little, more and more, utopia 
coming and the church is going to bring it about. Did you know such false teaching is growing rapidly among churches? In fact, we were in Indiana and a, a very strong, biblically-based church. I truly looked up to, to the pastor. Now, we weren't at this church. We were at a different. And the pastor shared with me what his friend, that they can't even speak now because he has bought into this. And on our radio show, many of you, any of you have Sirius XM radio? No. 34 million people do. Okay. <laughs> None are here, but uh, I, I won't even go to that. But if you did, in a couple weeks, we're going to be recording on Wednesday when we're back in Israel. We're recording about the doctrine, the teaching that all Scripture really deals with the past. And things are going to be made into a utopia. It's growing today rapidly. And the reason is people don't know the Word of God. So he speaks here about what is going to happen as a confirmation for the last days. And then beginning in verse 4, he speaks specifically to and about the disciples. From verses 3 on, 4 through 15, exclusively to and about disciples. How do we know that? He says you, referring to you disciples. Look at verse 14. He says, and this gospel must be preached to all the nations, right, throughout all the world as a testimony to the nations. And then what? Then the end will come. I'd underline that. You need to know what end is he referring to? See, it frustrates me when all these people have this, this view of the last days and such, and you go into a passage, the main teaching of Messiah on the last days, and you say, well, tell me, what end is he referring to? And they look at you as they've never thought about that. Problematic. He mentions the end three times from verses 3 to 14. So it's important. He's speaking specifically of the end of the church age. Verse 15, he says, When you see what was spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, he's speaking about the abomination of desolation. Very significant. I'm not going to answer or deal with the implications, but I think it's very significant that Messiah speaks about the abomination of desolation, heightens it, puts it first and foremost. And when Paul speaks in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 about the coming of Messiah, the establishment of the kingdom, he also heightens, underscores, presents, lifts up the abomination of desolation. It's important. It's relevant for believers. And then in the next verse, verse 16, there's a change. Because previously in verses 4 through 15, he speaks to you, you disciples. But in verse 16, there's a switch in language. There's a grammatical change. Instead of second person plural, he begins to speak in the third person plural. And he says, when you see they, when you see those in Judea, who's the emphasis? No longer on disciples, but emphasis on who? Israel, the Jewish people, and the land of Israel. And he talks about a time of persecution. There is a time of persecution going to take place, the worst time ever of persecution for the Jewish people. And it takes place immediately after the abomination of desolation. A very, I want to choose my words carefully, a question that I do not find pleasing is when someone comes up to me and they say, do you think that the Antichrist is Jewish? 
And I said, well, why? They said, well, I don't believe the Jewish people would accept the Antichrist unless he would be Jewish. My answer is always, where do you see in the scripture that the Jewish people, by and large, receive the Antichrist? I don't know any verse that says that. In fact, this time of persecution, what's called the trouble of Jacob or Jacob's tribulation, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. The reason why this worst time of tribulation comes upon the Jewish people is because precisely they reject the Antichrist. So if you have an understanding of prophecy, a basic one, one would not ask that question. The Jewish people, by and large, do not receive the Antichrist, and therefore he persecutes them severely. So we see, beginning in verse 16, where it says, let them flee to the mountains. We see this time of great tribulation upon the Jewish people, primarily, but not exclusively, but mentioned here in Israel. And then this section, verses 16 through 31, ends with what? The second coming. He quotes Zechariah about the heavens opening up and the Son of Man coming back to Jerusalem. And he speaks about the sign of that coming. That the moon, it's not going to be red, that's for the rapture. That's previously. No, this is the moon is dark, the sun is dark. There are catastrophic events in the, the heavens and upon earth. See, this is why, and I'm not trying to be, be offensive, I'm trying to warn you. Have you guard yourselves? Because I mentioned this in a live cast that we did maybe a year ago, but it greatly bothered me, all this attention about the so-called four blood moons. You know, they spoke about that, but if you look in Joel, where it's spoken of the primary text, many other things, right, accompanies it. They never spoke about that. Never spoke about that. When would the sun get dark? Totally dark. Don't recall that. When did the stars fall? When did all these things happen that Joel speaks about? So you can't just pick out something and it shows such poor poor biblical understanding. When you take an old English term for an eclipse, farmers used to call an eclipse a blood moon. This is not what the scripture's referring to here. It's dangerous, dangerous when we take a term out of context, having nothing to do with scripture, and because it sounds similar, we then apply it to the word of God. Very dangerous. So anyway, verse 31 ends with the second coming of Messiah. Now, our text begins in verse 32. And what we find here is that he goes back after outlining the birth pangs, what's going to happen to the church, the end of the church age, the abomination of desolation, and this time of great tribulation for, for Israel, and the second coming of Messiah. When that ends in verse 31, beginning in our text, verse 32, he's going to review these things and give us believers. He speaks, remember, now he's talking about you, you, you. He's speaking again to disciples, addressing them, not speaking about Israel. As far as speaking to them, he's speaking about them to us, his disciples. And notice what he says. Look at verse 32. The primary word, it's number two. We talked about it earlier. It's that conjunction day, not tie, but day. Speaking about a change, something not necessarily in conflict, but not something that continues on. So he's continuing, but in a different vein. He's speaking now once more about believers and what we should be doing. He says here, verse 32, and from the fig tree. Now, here again, what should you do? Put your cursor on fig tree. Find out 
where are the fig trees mentioned? And one of the places that you're going to see that it's mentioned clearly in the book of, of Hosea, right? In the book of Hosea, I believe it's chapter 9, and it speaks about Israel as the fig tree. So when he says here, from the fig tree, learn the parable. And the implication is to watch that fig tree, to pay attention. And God's so good. I mean, you can open up almost any paper in the United States, and you don't have to look too many days until you find an article on what? What's going on where? In Israel. Such a small country. But something happens there. You hear about all over the world. So he tells us, he's helping us. From the fig tree, learn the parable. Now, the word parable, it comes, it derives from an ancient Hebrew term, which is the word mashal, and it's where we get the Hebrew word government. So a parable is a, a teaching that should govern, should rule over your life. It's principles, truth that rules over us. We need to understand the message and apply our lives to it or live it based upon it. He says, whenever, whenever already the branches, her branches, fig tree is feminine, so it says in Greek, whenever her branches become what? Soft. And the leaves are, are going forth. You know that what's near? What does it say? Summer. Now, this is in Greek, but there's no question in my mind that Yeshua was speaking Hebrew because there is a, a grammatical connection between the word summer and end. So when he says the summer, we should also understand it, not only literal, but a reference to the end. So when Israel becomes like the fig tree, ripe, lush, prosperous, watch out because what's coming? The end. That's the wisdom here. And Israel is indeed prospering as we speak. Verse 33. Thus also, whenever you see all these things, now, who's he speaking of primarily? Disciples. So when you see what things? The things that the disciples, he tells them earlier from verses 4 through 15. Not necessarily what he says about Israel, because I don't believe that we'll be around when that happens. But when we see those birth pains, those things that he mentions in verses 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, when we see those things, he makes a promise. Look again. Thus also, whenever you see all these things, know that it is near. He is at the door. So once more, it goes back to what I talked about at the end of our previous study. When you see the birth pains, know what? He is coming. He is at the door. He is imminently relating to his people to gather them up. Now, why do I say that? Well, I don't believe, in fact, I know, and you'll know as well, that when it says he is near, it is not speaking about the second coming. Learn something. There is a difference between the blessed hope. What's another word for the blessed hope? Rapture. There is a difference between the rapture and the second coming. Very important that you make that distinction. Those who do not, they do not understand prophecy. Look again. Know that it's near, that he's at the door. Truly I say, verse 34, truly I say that this generation by no means, no, no, is what he literally says shall pass away until all these things 
come about. Now, what generation is he talking about? Not those that lived when he was speaking. Those who are alive and see what? All these things. Once these birth pangs and all that he mentions to what I would call the church in verses 4 and following to the end of verse 15, all of these things, once they begin, everything's going to come to an end. This age is going to come to an end within that generation. So the end times, in the technical sense, those, those last seven years, obviously they're all going to happen within one generation. There are some, some indicators, some events that lead up to those last seven years, but when they begin, that generation will not pass away. Let's continue. Verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away. That's true. When will it? At the end of what? The millennial reign. Exactly. When heaven and earth pass away, so will the law and the relevance of the law. And what will be established? The new Jerusalem, the eternal and final state of the kingdom of God. So he says, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but in contrast to that, that same word day, but the words of mine, no, no, shall never, is what we would translate, but literally, no, no, they will never pass away. Verse 36, and concerning those days and that hour, what's the next thing? No one knows. So concerning those days and that hour, no one knows. The implication is when these things are going to happen. We can't put a date. We have to wait for them to what? Begin. Are we near? I think there's prophetic indicators that we are. Iran rising up. Very significant. Persecution increasing. Very significant. Israel flourishing. The enemies around Israel. The hatred, the anti-Semitism that's spreading and growing. All of these are indicators that we're approaching. But you will never hear me give any calendar date, any definitive that we're really, really near. It's going to begin in next year. Won't ever say something like that. He says, no one knows the days or the hours. Not the angels of heaven, only who? Some manuscripts also have in different places say, nor the Son. Only one who knows is who? The Father. Now, this is to show the Son's humility, the Son's obedience. He is totally subjected to His Father. That's what the Son is. He serves, he glorifies, he's honoring, and he's subjected to. So only the Father knows. Now, what's important? Look at verse 37. We always have to confirm what we believe, why we believe it, and we confirm it by the Word of God. Notice what he says in verse 37. This is where we have something that is extremely hermeneutically significant because he says just as the days of Noah now what comes into your mind the days of Noah the answer is judgment correct God was angry with humanity and he judged them now usually when we think of the days of Noah we're not thinking about discipline we're not thinking of punishment but we're thinking of the outpouring of God's wrath because it brought about utter destruction. It destroyed, in one sense, the world. And God says, he'll never do that again. Is that correct? Well, he'll never do it how? With water. He's going to do it. But this time, the last time, he's going to do it with, you all know this, fire. Okay? So we read here. Just as the days of Noah, thus will be also 
the coming of the Son of Man. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is, there's two possibilities. The word here is parousia. Now, when we were in Dublin, we, we met in a room, our conference was in a room called parousia. So, so apropos, right? The word parousia means coming. But it specifically has to do with Messiah and His return. And here's something that you need to realize. Biblically, scripturally, it can apply to the rapture, when the heavens open up and Messiah comes, but He doesn't come all the way to Jerusalem. He comes to what the, the scholars in Hebrew call Hashemaim HaTachtonim, which is the lower heavens, meaning the sky. And He gathers us up to Him. That is the rapture. But parousia can also be literally the second coming. So we have to ask ourselves, which one are we speaking about here? Well, here's a biblical principle. The rapture happens before God's wrath. Why? Verse of scripture that I, I mentioned very frequently. 1 Thessalonians what? 5.9. God has not appointed you for wrath, but to obtain salvation. So I can be assured that the rapture is going to happen prior to the wrath of God. That much I can be assured of. 100%. So the rapture happens prior to, I would say, immediately before the wrath of God falls. The second coming happens at the end, the completion of the wrath of God. Now that's a fact. Now the question we have to do is to say, what are we speaking about here? Because we read, just as in the days of Noah, thus will be the coming of the Son of Man. Well, Noah, he lived previous. He did his work prior to the flood primarily, correct? His mission, his call. Before we answer any more, let's just keep reading. For just as they were in those days, before the flood, ah, this helps us, because the flood depicts God's judgment, correct? So we're talking about the days prior to the flood. So now we have an indication that this coming, this parousia, this coming of Messiah, is not the second coming, but it's coming for His people. Because the second coming is at the end of His wrath. So when we look at the text, not reading into it, not trying to interpret it in some other way, just taking the simple truth, but paying attention to the words. We read again, verse 38. For just as, they were in the days before the flood. What were people doing? Eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage right up until the days that Noah entered into the ark. So we know something. Noah entered into the ark with his family, his wife, his three sons, their spouses, and those animals. He did so before the flood, right? And the flood represents God's judgment, God's wrath. So he says, see, during the wrath of God, no one was eating, no one was drinking, no one was getting married, right? They, they didn't do that even very long. Okay. They drowned. They were destroyed. So in this same way, we have an image. Just as in those days when people were carrying on normally. See, what's going to happen is this. There's going to be these birth pains. They are going to give rise to great instability in the world. There's going to be an enemy that rises up. And it's called the, the ram. The ram. And Daniel tells us it is a Iranian empire. And it is going to spread from the east 
to the west, northward to the south. It is going to cause great havoc, pain, death, sorrow. It is going to be barbaric. And the world is going to have a sense of hopelessness. But suddenly, there's going to rise up out of the west, that is Europe. They use the Hebrew term Yavan, which is in modern Hebrew, Greece, but it just speaks to Europe. And it's going to rise up this empire out of Europe. And it is going to destroy that ram. This empire is going to be called by the term what? Goat. And the world is going to be so thankful for the destruction of this evil empire known as the ram. But here's the problem. The Antichrist comes out of the goat. And he's going to bring a time of peace, stability. Remember what, what the scripture says. When they proclaim peace and safety, then what? Sudden destruction. So this is why before God's wrath falls, after the destruction of the ram, which I believe happens before the final seven years, the Antichrist is going to rule. He's going to bring about peace, prosperity, safety for Israel, for everyone. But he is going to be this empire known as the beast. What is going to be setting upon it? A harlot, right? And that harlot, and if we had time, we could show this in the book of Revelation and prophetically. This harlot has to do with not sexual immorality, but spiritual immorality. What am I speaking about? Idolatry. See, things are going to be wonderful materially. There's not going to be war. Things are going to be good. And it's going to be because of this Antichrist empire. One that is going to initially, initially, allow whatever type of idolatrous lifestyle and behavior and worship, whatever you want to do, be my guest. And there's going to be a few pesky, pesky people called born again. And we're going to say, this is not right. This is not godly. This is not pleasing. This is not righteousness. And he's going to hate us. And we're going to be persecuted. But the world seemed the same way. There Was there not a big difference between Noah and his family and everyone else? They were proclaiming God's coming judgment. And they were scoffed at. They were rejected. They did not bring one convert. Not one. Just his family. They all thought it was ridiculous. In that same way, people are going to be marrying. We won't be. Eating, drinking. No. We're going to be in prison. We're going to be suffering. We're going to be rejected. Many of us are going to be put to death. But the world is going to be eating, drinking, marrying, being given in marriage up until the time that things change. Just like in the days of Noah. Look at verse 39. Speaking about the world, it says, referring this back to the days of Noah. And they did not know until the flood came. They did not have any prophetic insight. They did not listen to the truth of those who were sharing it. They did not know any of what was going to happen to them prior to what? The flood came same way. The world won't understand it until the wrath falls. And what it says? And he carried all of them. Now, here's the debate. Is this phrase here, it literally is the word to be lifted up. Is that what it says in your Bible? Someone will read their verse. We are speaking about verse 39. Took them away. Swept them away. It is the same word that is used primarily for Messiah being lifted up, both on the cross and resurrection. There's another word, but it's tied to that, the root is. So among the scholars, they, they debate, who are we speaking about? 
Are we speaking about those evil ones that were swept away in the flood? Or are we talking about Noah and his family that were lifted up from the earth in the ark? They were above the water, right? They weren't in the water. They were lifted up. Now, how do we answer that? Well, notice what it says. Thus will be also at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, primarily, the term Son of Man, when you look at it, is it a term that relates to Messiah for the believer or the non-believer? The answer is, if you do a good study of it, for the believer. Because the term son, what did I say it meant? Son has to do with servant. Son has to do with heir. The son of man, we're talking about humanity, he came to serve. What does the scripture say? That the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom to many. Who's the many? We are. So when we look at it, it speaks about something that relates to the people. I believe when it says lifted up, they're talking about Noah and his family. And the reason why I say that is when we look at the next verse, verse 40, we see a, an image, two images, that seem to confirm that interpretation. Here again, I'll share it. You decide whether you agree or not. And it really, in regard to Bible teaching, my objective is to not get you to agree with me. That's not. My objective, objective is to get you pondering the Word of God, being brought under the illumination of the Holy Spirit because He should be our teacher, not some individual. I mean, I listen to things. In fact, yesterday we were driving down to uh, Cleveland and we, ha we in TV, cars do the, the, the darkness things right now, okay? Okay? We have a van that some other people bought in Israel that we get to use, and it doesn't even have a place to, to, to charge your phone, let alone to connect your phone to the, the system, and you can go on and listen to music that you choose, not the radio, and you can even hear podcasts. You can even hear Rick and Mary's podcast driving down the street. We didn't do that, by the way. We listen to me. <laughs> and Rifka, I said, just pick one. I didn't like it at all. Oh, I'd love to redo it. So that's just a good example. Don't listen and believe everything you hear. Listen in order to help you understand the Word of God. And do your studying yourself. Do your own due diligence. So look at what it says in verse 40. It says, then, and this is a word to help us understand it's also a conjunction. Then, in light of what we just heard, it says, then two will be in the field, and one will be taken, and one will be left. Now, I don't think there's anyone that, that I know that hears this scripture and not associated with what? the rapture so one is being what one is being taken in the same way that we see it earlier when one is or this group all of them are lifted up who all of Noah's family by who the son of man so it says verse 40 then two will be in the field one will be taken and one will not now what do you know about this they're both where? In the same location. So being in a certain place, am, if I am in Jerusalem, does that assure that I'm going to be part of the rapture? No. And if I happen to be here in Tennessee, does that mean I'm going to be left out of the rapture? Because God doesn't even know where Tennessee is. No. no. It has nothing to do with location. Nothing to do with location. Something else matters, and it's faith. Secondly, look at verse 41. And two will be grinding at the mill. 
One will be taken and one will be left. So it's not even what you're doing. So there's nothing that I can do that ensures some action, some performance that assures that I'll be taken in the rapture, right? It's not about an action, it's not about works, and it's not about location. It's about what? The gospel message. Do I have a new covenant relationship with Messiah through His blood by the cross? Is that my faith? If it is, then I'm going to be that one taken. If I don't, then I'm going to be that one left. And then he says something. Look at verse 42. He says, therefore, meaning in light of all of this, he says, watch. Very, very important word. Now, here again, Rick and Mary built what they built in order to assist you. Because you should look at that and say, wow, this is in the imperative. When you go through the grammar, it will tell you that this word is an imperative, which means what? Command. So Messiah is speaking and he's commanding us to watch. What, what does that mean? What does it mean? See, that word also sometimes is translated, take heed, look out, be alert. It's a warning. So a good thing when you come across words like that, you must, it's not an option, not if you want to know the Word of God. You need to click, and we have it so easy today. We don't have to carry this big, big book. I used to have to do that. But now, with just a phone, I can go a couple of pushes of a button. And now I have a list, maybe in Matthew, maybe in the rest of the New Testament, whatever I choose. And I can see how that word is used, how specifically Yeshua used that word. And you know, it's the same word when Messiah was in the garden and he warned his disciples, going back 2,000 years. He says on Passover, he says, uh, watch. What did he mean? Pray. But he says, watch. How did they do? Watching. Just for that one hour. That's all they had to do. Watch for one hour. How did they do? What would you give them? Zero. Not good. Now, the question, when I see the connection between this word and that use, I wonder, are we going to do any better? We look at them and say, guys, you blew it. Are we going to do any differently are we really watching watching with prophetic insight let me tell you my opinion is that the church is doing miserably today so many and they're good people they, they i believe they love god i have no doubt that they are saved by god's grace but my problem is when someone will say, will you come and speak to our church? I say, yeah, if the pastor allows. And I'll go and I'll meet a wonderful pastor. Loves his people. Evangelical. And they'll say, what are you going to be talking about? And I'll tell them. I say, we're going to be speaking about, and I see this just glazed look. <laughs> it's sad. And I said, well, where did you study? Well, I, 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 I've never been to, to seminary. I've never you know, taken a class on eschatology. I've never... When, when you go in the pulpit to speak, oh, he says, I, I, just, I read a passage of Scripture, I consult a few commentaries, and I just pray, God, give me the words, and it's very dangerous. I, I'm not criticizing to be mean, but what would you think about your physician. You have surgery tomorrow morning. He said, well, I, I've never been to medical school. I, I've never taken the time. I kind of just glance through some medical journals and I come and stand over you and I pray and... This is even more important. 
Because if you're saved and you get a bad doctor, it's all good, right? It's all good. Because to be absent from the body is to be all good. Okay. We do not put the emphasis in the right place. The church today, by and large, is powerless because we are not walking in the anointing because there's a connection between the Word, God's truth, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And when we look here, let's go back. He says in verse 42, therefore, watch. I don't believe we're watching because we don't even know what to look for. He says, because you do not know what hour, who's coming? The, did you see the change? See the change? Son of man, Savior, sometimes Yeshua. But here, there's a change. The Lord. That's who's coming. Now that is a, a sobering thought. He's coming, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. See, he might be someone's Savior, but they do not relate to him as Lord. He's coming as Lord. Look again. Therefore, you, it's in the plural, you watch. Because you do not know. Actually, it's in the singular, I believe. You do not know what hour your Lord comes. Because, he says, if the master of the house, if he knew at what hour, speaking about if he knew what watch, that the thief was coming, what would he do? He would be watching and guarding, and he would not allow his home to be broken into. So, if we knew it, we could ensure it. If I knew August 1st, 2020, Messiah is coming back. We knew it. We'd all be ready, wouldn't we? All be ready. But we don't know. We have to be watching for signs. In fact, he says something quite interesting. Look at our last verse, verse 44. On account of... Of this, also you be ready, be prepared. Why? Now, this is something that you need to underline. It is a promise. It is truth from Messiah himself. Be ready, be watching, because at the hour that you do not, what does your Bible say? Expect, think, it's a word, suppose. Now, it is a word that, that basically has to do with a, a conclusion reached based upon information. You have a supposition because of certain factors, right? And what he's saying here is, based upon assumption, you'll never get it. You will not know the Son of Man, this Lord of Lords. Be ready, because at the hour that you do not suppose, the Son of Man will come. Therefore, what do I have to be doing? I have to be watching when? At all times. Watching for what? What he says. There's these birth pains, of course. There's these things that happen, but... There is no specific sign of the day or the hour. We should know the general season. Now, he uses the example of a thief breaking in. They knew something. Thieves don't come when, by and large, broad daylight. That's why he speaks about the night watches. Thieves come at one of the night watch, but we don't know which one. So to be assured, we have to be watching all the time. The time is getting near. There's going to be greater spiritual prophetic indicators to notice that we're real close. But we won't ever know the day or the hour. 
Therefore, he says, be ready. What does that mean? Be ready. Be obedient. Be prayerful. Be evangelical. Be sober-minded. Be clear-minded. Be instruments of God's glory. Be instruments of ministry. Be full of good works. Because all these things will give us a greater... He's going to give us a reward. What's that reward? What was it? Understanding. Discernment. So that we can understand things better. So that we can grow closer. Be more successful in bringing more and more people to the right preparation for what God's going to do in the last days. We are living in a very significant time. The question is, are we really watching like we should? Things are happening. What's the first thing he tells us to do? Watch what? That fig tree. And that's why when there's individuals that, that are well thought of Bible teachers and they say things that there's no more significance to the land of Israel. God isn't interested in real estate. This has nothing to do with, with God's future plan. You know, there's one pastor, and he's retired now, thank God. And as he was, was I think, celebrating his 25th, 30th anniversary at his church, being in the same pulpit, his church wanted to give him a present. And they thought, you know what would be nice? Send him to Israel. And he got wind of this, and this is what he told the congregation. And I know people in that congregation. They said, he said, don't waste your money sending me to Israel. Fix my car. Pay my mortgage. He says, because there's nothing significant in God's purposes and plans in that land. Okay? And he is thought of as a very respected Bible teacher. Speaks, invited to large conferences, the Society of Biblical Literature each year, the, the conference, I think it's in Sweden, or Switzerland, excuse me. What's the town? Lucerne? Lucerne, Sw uh, Switzerland, for the, the uh, Society of Biblical Literature. Frequent sp speaker. This is the state of Christianity today. No, we need to be watching. Well, I'll close Okay, um, so we're going to have a little bit of time of um, questions, and then we'll take a break, short break, and then we'll um, wrap up. But um, why do you um, why do you think uh, the rapture is under such attack today? Because a true believer who anticipates lives in light of the rapture, he is going to live very differently. When we talk about the purpose of the rapture. It is a blessed hope to keep us from what? Judgment? No. Persecution? No. The wrath of God. And people don't really believe that there is any more the wrath of God. So that's why this, this, this blessed hope has been kind of set aside. Let me tell you, no one likes better this setting aside of a blessed hope than, than the enemy. And the scripture I'll give you because people always say to me, we get, right? She goes on again. Okay. We get tons of email, people saying, why do you call the blessed hope, the rapture, the blessed hope? I said, because of what it says in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Read it. That's the biblical term. The rapture comes from the word that means to be snatched away. It's in the Bible, this, this arpezo, to be snatched away, taken up. But the word rapture comes from the Latin that's used, the Latin translation. Rapturo. But the biblical term is blessed hope. So what God bless me with and blesses every believer with that hope, I think we should appreciate it and be, be good stewards of that promise. Um, the, the other question I have is the Trinity is under attack too, and I don't, you don't have to spend it, but why do you think these basic things are under attack? <laughs> because there's power in truth. And it all goes to attack the identity of, of Yeshua. If, if we don't believe he's divine, 
And when we talk about two things, the virgin birth and the Trinity, the main purpose, there's other implications to them, but they all are foundational in teaching and proclaiming the divinity of Messiah. And if he's not the Son of God, if we don't really believe that, we don't know who he is. And if you don't know who he is, his true identity, people say to me, uh, do you believe someone can be saved without believing in the virgin birth? I say, no. They go, well, aren't you adding to Scripture? Where does it say you must believe? I said, but here's the problem. If you don't believe in a biblical Jesus, if you don't know who he is, how can you be saved? So it's the virgin birth that confirms his identity as the divine son of God. So they want to remove that. They want to take those truths away because when we don't believe correctly, it weakens us. Yeah, it's interesting because if you run into Jehovah's Witnesses or they run into you, they don't believe that Christ is the Son of God. And the problem is you just need to ask them one question. What's the gospel? And they can't answer that. And the second thing is you better get this right because you're going to need to be saved. <laughs> so who's going to save you? And it's not going to be your works. So um, one of the other things is you kind of hinted about this, and I know they probably have a lot more questions, so these are my questions. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a movement out there called the New Apostolic Reformation that I shared with you. And the New Apostolic Reformation's focus is really on signs and wonders. And they'll actually attack a Christian that's, that comes back and says, why are you focused on signs and wonders? And they'll say, you don't believe in a, in a God who is powerful and you, you have fake Christianity or whatever. Do you want to talk about that? In our next session, I'm going to begin with, with that issue. I do have something. People don't wear jackets anymore, but if you do, whether you're male or female, if you have blazers, we've got sometimes where's your back? Uh, wears a, a blazer. If you'd like, we have up here um, a little button, a lapel, is it a lapel pin? Uh, so if you'd like one of these, they're absolutely free. Um, so if you put it on, remember to pray for our work. And okay. what we're doing, okay. I'll give you one. Well, thanks, but that's two. Okay. <laughs>